Hi, I'm Kate Snarsky. I'm the lymphoma lead at UCLH, and I'm delighted to be here with um, Dr. Swami Ayer, who leads the T-cell lymphoma program at the MD Anderson, and we're delighted to speak to Vijay Himonk on highlights in T-cell lymphoma at ASH 22. Thank you, Kate. Uh, and it's, it's also uh, an important conversation this morning on T-cell lymphomas. Kate, what do you think has, has caught your eye so far? Well, there have been a number of exciting things. I think it's important to highlight initially the real world data we've had. I mean, really highlighting how miserable the prognosis for many of our patients with T cell lymphoma still is. So there's a huge cohort of, I think, over 800 patients with HTLV1, really reminding us that throughout the world, the prognosis is really poor with um, you know, median overall survival in months, not even in years, and really not very different in the US to the Caribbean or Japan. Um, I also, I think it was really helpful to have the update from the Nordic study, which was a prospective study initially published in JCO, but we had more than 10 year follow up. But again, a reminder that more than 50% of patients are gonna relapse. So thinking about that when we first see patients, these are even the fit, transplant eligible patients and you know less than 50% are alive and disease free and my one of my other highlights was the data about CNS relapse in T cell lymphoma we've always sort of thought it's similar um, in terms of the risk factors to patients with B cell lymphoma but there was a really large data set from UPenn um, which was helpful to clarify risk factors for CNS relapse and also give us some sense of the incidence but I think, again, like I've mentioned about relapsed T-cell lymphoma. What about your highlights for how we can deal with this really you know, challenging reality? I agree. And I think it's given that uh, patients with T-cell lymphoma relapse, and, uh, and, and I'm sure many of you uh, understand this problem. The, the, the promising studies that we were looking for, and I think the update from, from the article, uh, led by Dr. Lemonier and looked at uh, azacitidine. Azacitidine is an old drug, but it's an oral formulation that was compared to best supportive care, uh, gemcitabine, romidepsin, uh, and the pre-specified endpoints were not met. However, and, and the pre-specified endpoint was a PFS. It's about uh, five, month, five and a half months to two, two months comparatively. But the overall survival is pretty long for the oral azacitidine. So I think uh, this is something that I think through uh, treating relapsed refractory lymphoma patients, and I'm sure you've seen this. We have to design studies. You can't have very high expectations. You want to bring new drugs to the clinic. So how do we design studies in, in such a way that uh, the design doesn't uh, 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 pulls the whole idea down? I would still say that oral is a is a good agent, and perhaps the, the overall survival is one example for this. And we want to see how this is going to go forward. Also, I was just going to say, also it was very much biology driven, as in it was only for the T follicular, like, and in terms of angioplastic. And do you think that we're going to have? trials in the future targeted to specific entities? Absolutely. I think that's the way to go. We have 32 different entities in T-cell lymphoma, the WHO, the ICC classification. The, uh, the TFH is now carved out of uh, a little bit from the PDCL NOS as a TFH subtype and the follicular T helper uh, T-cell uh, T lymphoma. And now it's the largest entity in the in the nodal's uh, variety of T-cell lymphomas and about 40 percent. So, and, and some of these agents, including the azacitidine, including the studies that uh, are uh, Dr. Bedia from MD Anderson is presenting this evening, uh, uh, all focus on that part. And you are seeing responses, and particularly with the biologics, because it uh, enables a better uh, way of tackling the microenvironment. And also, because the T follicular helper is just sitting in a very rich microenvironment, so uh, studies such as pembrolizumab, which uh, tackles the, the T cells in the microenvironment, and aromidepsin, perhaps uh, are ways to go forward. And in fact, uh, the data that you'll see it shows an overall survival uh, advantage of about 21 months in this relapsed refractory population. So you mentioned about PD-1 inhibitors, and we know in terms of NKT, its efficacy. But I always remember the, you know, the report in ATL about hyperprogressions. So as you say, in terms of your study, which you know you're you're presenting here, so the Robbie Depson with the PD-1. In terms of, um, you're excited about that combination? Oh, absolutely. And I think the hyperprogression is uh, maybe relevant biologically to ATL. Uh, but uh, TFH, some of these cells ex actually express PD-1. That's one of the identifying markers for a T follicular helper phenotype. Uh, in the study, there were two patients that are clinically called hyperprogressors, but it is a clinical
clinical call, not uh, verified. It could have been a sort of progression, could have been a tumor flare. But uh, the study uh, design was tweaked to have uh, uh, pembrolizumab on day one, nadomidepsin on day eight, and that changed the kinetics. We didn't see the hyperprogression that is reported. So I clearly think that PD-1 by itself may not be sufficient. I think it's the combination that gives you the synergy. And I think that brings us to several other checkpoint therapies, including the do not eat me inhibitor. And also, I would say your CAR T. I think Kate. Yeah, in my very objective data. way, I'm very yeah. excited about that. <laughs> so, um, you know, I presented some data at EHAR, and we have a poster presentation sort of um, updating a bit. So it's an auto for, so it's TRBC1 directed um, CAR T. But I, it, although it's only phase one, I mean, we've treated 10 patients and four of those I've treated and seen clinical responses in three of those four that are durable beyond nine months. So it's the durability in certainly for the cohort of patients I've treated where they've never been in remission. And I'm now seeing, you know, we, we had to ask the question, should we allograph these patients? And they were older, you know, not we didn't have a donor for some, but seeing such durability, I find exciting. Oh, it's very encouraging and so kudos to you and your team that's uh, uh, brought this forward and hopefully it's going to uh, help more patients. And that brings us to a very important point. I think we've discussed this before. How can we enable all this newer therapies and the biology, the, the newer information on biology uh, out to everybody? And I think one of the efforts, and maybe you can elaborate on this, is to uh, uh, the trifecta of science, the platform, and the collaboration, not just in a few centers, but across the world. So we have the ability to collect prospective data, uh, integrate the biology, uh, even at the histopathology level, and then bring therapies. And I think these are great efforts. And Kate, you want to add to that? Well, I would say that, I mean, I've worked a lot in, in CNS lymphoma and our collaborations with our European colleagues and, you know, conducting large trials in a rare disease has been a really, you know, satisfying experience over the last decade. I'm really sort of um, challenged by the reality that in T-cell lymphoma over decades, we haven't really made progress for our patients. And we do really need to improve the outcome for our patients. And I really welcome the conversation, the collaborations, and as you say, um, sort of embracing our biological insights and science um, in terms of international collaboration. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.